Hey everyone, and welcome to today's call, Jewish-Arab Relations in the Shadow of War, Data uh, Research and Insights from Social Psychology. This is another call in our series uh, in partnership with the Social Venture Fund for Jewish-Arab Equality and Shared Society and the Jewish Funders Network. Um, on our last call, uh, we introduced the challenges and concerns about the impact of this crisis on Jewish-Arab relations in Israel. And in that call, we heard an opening from Ron Gerlitz, uh, CEO of Accord, that featured some of the findings from their October 18th survey on Jewish-Arab attitudes in the peak of tensions. We also heard a little bit about the framing that social psychology gives for intergroup relations in times of crisis. Today, we get to go deeper into the findings of that research and what, from a social psychology standpoint, uh, they suggest are some of the options for preventing deterioration and maintaining cohesion among Jewish and Arab citizens at this time and for the days ahead. We are so grateful that both Professor Iran Halperin, founder and chair of Accord, and Ron Gerlitz are with us here today to share their insights. I want to emphasize that while we are hearing about Jewish-Arab relations in Israel, I don't know of any other time uh, since I've been here that everyone joining this call uh, to learn is as much subject to the tensions and intense emotions and concerns that are um, provoked by, by this crisis and that uh, we're as much subject as audience. And I hope that this call provides some clarity in this respect um, individually and professionally and I encourage you to share your questions and comments in that respect as well uh, in the chat. We have one hour for this call. For those of you who don't have a hard stop, um, Ron and Iran may graciously be able to stay another 15 minutes after for continued discussion. Um, and we may be able to stop in the middle for some questions. So uh, with, and we'll have time at the end for more questions with no further ado. Uh, please, Iran, uh, we're happy to see you again. Thank you, Iran. And thanks everyone for, for joining. And I must say, you know, I, I already see on, on, on this call many of our friends and, and, and you know, you, you've heard me speaking, I think, quite a few times. I think that this time is different. Uh, it's different because it's, you know, it's difficult for everyone. It's difficult, I would say, you know, for me personally, it's even difficult to say, you know, to be the one who's supposed to know what's happening and to analyze the situation and to understand and to predict what's going to happen. I don't think that any of us can pretend as if we are in this position. Um, but, but but I'll try to do my best. I know that, you know, the, the attention of many of us is to the, you know, to see if the, the the eleven hostages are coming back home this evening, and it's it's nine kids that are supposed to 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 come back, and it's 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 tough. It's tough for all of us, and I think that we are in 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 a critical moment, and and we're we're in a critical moment for for Israel, for the Israeli society, in in so many different you know ways and, and aspects. And 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 what what we're going to talk about today is specifically about the fact that you know we are in a critical moment in terms of you know the 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 issue of Jewish Arab relations within Israel, and what I'll try to do in this in this in this in the thirty minutes that I have before we'll open it for Q and A and and Ron will add will add his part is to provide some kind of a you know, an analysis from, from a socio-psychological perspective of the situation. Some of it is, is an analysis of both groups, both Jews and Arabs, and some of it is, is, is more specific to the Jewish perspective and to the Arab perspective. I'm, you know, aware of the fact that it's a little bit weird that, that a Jewish professor is talking about the Arab perspective, but it's mostly relying on data and research that we've done in the last, like, Six or six or seven, six or seven, seven weeks, and in the remaining part, in the last part of the of the conversation, I'll try to offer some ideas or some tools that maybe can be effective in in dealing with with this situation. Again, based on on the research that we've done in 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 a call. And 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 feel free to to you know to raise questions on on the chat, or you know you can even be 
impolite and ask questions during my my my, my talk it will be will make everything more more interesting at least at least for me and I want to start by saying that you know I've already said that we're in a critical moment I think that you know the Israeli society is going through and, and that's not going to be a new thing for for anyone here the Israeli society is going through what we as psychologists would call a collective trauma and when a society goes through collective trauma it you know it it sends send us all to ask very very deep questions about you know who we are what's what, what is our story what are we here for what's our identity what's our values the most basic questions are asked right now within the israeli society it also means that the narrative of you know the story of Jewish Arab relations within the Israeli society is rewritten these days. And, and that's a crucial point. It's rewritten during these days. And, 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 and think about it for a second. If you, if you go back to October 7th, two very, very different stories about Jewish Arab relations within Israel could have been you know, shaped from October 7th and up until now. On October 7th, you know, right after the events of October 7th, we've done a study, we, we've run a study among Jews and Arabs in Israel, and we asked people to predict, to predict, do they think that another cycle of violence is gonna erupt between Jews and Arabs immediately after the events of October 7th? 91% of the Jews in Israel said, that they believe that we're about to see a new cycle of violence. And more than 70% of the Arabs said the same, which means that there was almost a consensus among Jews and Arabs, and that's more or less the only consensus between Jews and Arabs now in Israel, that we're gonna see internal violence between Jews and Arabs within the Israeli society. And this is the point in which two very different narratives could have been shaped in, in what we see here between Jews and Arabs. One, one option could have been, and that's the worst case scenario, that you know Jews would have told themselves, everything that we predicted is now happening. When Israel is in its weakest point in the history, when there's a chance that maybe Israel will not even, you know, will not even exist after what Hamas did on October 7th, when we saw, you know, the, 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 the most difficult fears of all Israelis, now Arabs within Israel would join Hamas and will join the Palestinians and will utilize this moment to hurt Israel and to try and destroy the country. And if this would have happened, I'm not saying that this would have been a success, success in terms of of, of Arabs joining uh, 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 the, the, the Hamas, etc. But if this would have happened, this could have led to the, to, to the worst case scenario in terms of the narrative of Jewish Arab relations within Israel, because that's, you know, that's the nightmare. That's the nightmare of Arabs being the, you know, the, the, the ultimate traitors joining the, the, the enemies of Israel in this, in the, in, in this scenario. On the, you know, on the other hand, an alternative narrative, and that's the narrative that we see right now in Israel, an alternative narrative that can, can be shaped during these events can say something like the following, you know, we have our disagreements, we disagree on many things with, within Israel, there's a discrimination against Arabs, inequality, uh, Arabs, you know, of course, identify to some extent with the Palestinian cause. But when such dramatic event is happening in Israel, when such dramatic event is happening in Israel, we are all in this together, at least in some aspects. And it should be said that despite our fears, and, and I'm saying it, you know, in, in, I'm being very cautious in saying it because, you know, tomorrow morning this can change and, and it should be said. But at least at this point, despite all the predictions of many of us, and despite the fact that, you know, there are leaders even within the Israeli government who tried to, you know, to promote these 
this cycle of violence to incite against the Arab population within Israel, what we see right now is more, you know, leaning towards the more positive narrative or leaning towards the more positive story. And, 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 and it creates some hope and maybe some potential to build something more constructive, even though these situations are so problematic. But after saying all that, I want to look at both groups and maybe say why. Sorry? Anyone? No. Okay. After, after saying all that, I want to look at both groups and say a few words about the dominant themes that create the danger or the potential for an explosion between Jews and Arabs within Israel today. And I wanna start by talking about four different themes and I'll try to do it very, very quickly. The first one, and, and, and that's very, very clear, I think for everyone, is that both societies, mainly the Jewish society, but both the Jewish and the Arab society are experiencing probably the highest levels of fear and anxiety that they've ever felt in the history, ever. I'll talk about it more in, 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 in later parts of my, of, my, of my talk, but that's the starting point. You know, societies under threat, societies that can truly imagine that maybe, you know, in a week or two, we will not exist. We will not exist as a collective, and we will not exist as individuals. This is, it creates huge threat and threat can lead very, very easily to very negative things in terms of the relations between the two groups within the society. Just to show you one graph, I know that some of you already, already saw it, but just to, to, to share with you one graph, just a second. Okay. What you see here, that's, that's a longitudinal study that we've conducted in a code, a longitudinal study, meaning we, we got back to the same individuals again and again and again. I know that some of you already saw this graph in Ron's presentation, but what you see here is that levels of fear of Jews are the highest that they've been here in, in, you know, in the last two years, but I, I, I have data you know, long, long before these two years, levels of fear are at their peak very, very clearly, and also levels of fear of Arabs are very, very, very high. So that's that's the first the first thing. The second thing that we should take into account is that when people are under threat, when people feel that their life, both individually and collectively, are in danger, and they feel like they are the ultimate victims of the situation, they experience a sense of you know what we call moral licensing. It's not trivial that the metaphor that Jews use, Jews in Israel use to this situation are metaphors, you know, going back to metaphors of the Holocaust, of Nazis. And when you talk to Arabs these days in Israel, many of them are talking about, you know, they, 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 their fear of being excluded and their metaphors are metaphors of the Nakba. And both societies, went back to their, you know, their ultimate trauma. And going back to the ultimate trauma, provided them with, with the moral licensing of, you know, we can do whatever we need, whatever we need to protect ourselves if the equivalent to what we experience right now is, you know, our metaphors of Nakba or Holocaust or whatever it will be. And this creates huge potential for intergroup violence within the Israeli society, because in many, many ways, the moral boundaries or the moral restrictions are released because people from both groups are so, feel so threatened and so worried about their mere existence. The third thing that I want to talk about, and that's not trivial, is that I call it the theme of the ultimate misunderstanding. The ultimate misunderstanding. If you talk to Jews in Israel these days, most of them will tell you, we don't understand what, why do Arabs say that they're afraid of, you know, leaving their 
homes. Why do Arabs say that they're afraid of posting anything in social media? Why do they have to, why do they have to be afraid of anything? If someone has to be, has to be afraid, it's us that experience what, you know, what the Hamas did on October 7th, uh, uh, six or seven weeks ago. And, our, uh, and Jews are saying, we don't understand why they, why they say that they're so, 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 so afraid. And we don't understand why don't they express full identification and support with Israel right now? Why are they presenting, why are Arabs presenting a more nuanced or more complex view of the situation? We expect them to fully support us Israelis. When you talk to Arabs, what they say is that we don't understand why Jews even suspect that we support Hamas actions on October 7th. And why do we have to condemn all the time the actions of Hamas? We were the victims, or we, we, were, we, we, we were also the victims of these, of, of, of these events. We did not support them. Immediately after October 7th, all our leaders went out and publicly against what happened in October 7th. So why are Jews treating us so aggressively? Why are Jews asking us to condemn everything all the time? Most Arabs will tell you right now that they feel insulted by the fact that Jews that are questioning them all the time and, and they don't understand the situation. So Jews don't understand why do Arabs, why are they afraid? Why aren't they supporting us immediately? And Arabs don't understand why are they are Jews being so suspicious about them when they were part of the, you know, the victims of this situation. And what you can see here, and that's part of the same study that we've done, is, is, is an illustration of this full, what I call the full misunderstanding of both parties. What you see on the right, on the right side of this, of this slide is that generally almost all Jews and all Arabs are against violent or, or Jewish Arab escalation of violence against each other. You can see that it's 98% of the Arabs and 90% of the, the Jews, but, but it means that there is almost a full consensus among both societies that they're, they're against violence. At the same time, when Jews and Arabs are asked, how, I mean, what's the percentage among the other group that you think that support violence, both of them are saying that it's 50% or more. So that's, again, another demonstration of this misunderstanding. Jews truly believe that at least 50% or 56% of the Arabs support the Hamas violence. And Arabs truly believe that at least 50% of the Jews support violence again against Arabs these days within Israel. So there's a, a, a huge misunderstanding between these two groups within, within the current situation. And the third thing that is, that is again, very, very unique to this situation is the theme of, I would call it um, abandoning. The theme of abandoning. Usually, think about it, when there are tensions or conflicts, between two groups within a certain society. So everyone understands that there's a government that can somehow manage the relations. There's a government, there's a police, there's someone, there, there are leaders that we can trust that can manage the situation between these two groups. In Israel, in the last 12 months, but more specifically since October 7th, Citizens totally mistrust the government. Arab citizens totally mistrust the government even before October 7th. And Jewish citizens totally mistrust the government since October 7th. The, the, the word that is very, very frequently used among many Israelis, in Hebrew we say, Afkara. The government abandoned us as citizens. We don't have anyone to trust. And when there are two groups that are in conflict and there are, there are tensions between these two groups and these two groups 
feel that there's no one to trust over there in the government, it creates huge potential for violence. I mean, the fact that so many Israelis, you know, bought new weapons, and there are so many weapons in the Arab society, this really, really create potential for, for escalation because people say, if we can't trust the government and if Arabs or Jews are threatening us, you know, I have to do something about it myself. I have to defend or protect my family or my friends and I have to do it myself. And this can very, very, very easily escalate in, into an explosion between Jews and Arabs within Israel. So these are the themes that are common to both groups. I wanna take five more minutes and talk about the more specific perceptions or views of each and every one of these groups because I think that there are clear distinctions between them. And I'll start with, 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 with the Jews in Israel. And, and the Jews in Israel, I can say very clearly, and I said it before, experience, have been experiencing in the last seven weeks the most dramatic sense of anxiety, collective and individual anxiety, that they've ever felt in their life. Not even in one Yom Kippur war. You know, I got a phone call from a very close friend of mine, a professor of social psychology, six weeks ago. I want her, in, her name. And she asked me, she called me in, in, in the evening, three days after the events of October 7, and she said, Iran, tell me the truth. Is there a chance that it's over? That like in two or three weeks, we will simply not exist? And if you think about, you know, this psychologically, this sense of existential threat is a very, very, very deep feeling that many Jews in Israel experience these days for the first time, both collectively and individually, you know, I hear so many people around me saying, you know, it's the first time in my life in which I felt that there is a chance that I will have to physically defend my kids against Hamas, you know, terrorists. Or I I've never imagined that something like that can happen to me. And I'm saying all this because, you know, when people experience su such deep sense of anxiety, the fact that they develop very, very high levels of hate and hostility towards anyone that is associated with the source of hate, that's probably the most expected thing we could imagine. So I'm not saying that the levels of hate, the, 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 the very, very, very high levels of hate that Jews experience now towards Arab, I'm not, I, I, I don't want to normalize it. I don't want to say that it's okay that people feel hatred towards Arabs, but I'm saying that this is probably what we would expect people to feel when they feel, when, when, when they feel that their life are under threat. And I'll show you this. This is, this is again a graph of levels of hatred. You know, usually people don't say that they hate. They say, you know, I'm, I, feel, I'm, I feel fear, I'm angry at their actions. They don't say that they hate some. What you see here are levels of hate of Jewish Israelis towards Arabs within Israel on a scale of one to six. And you can see a huge increase from March 23 to October 23, that's, that's an increase that you know, I've never seen in my life. To, to, to the level of, of, of four, it means that almost two thirds of Israelis are feeling hatred towards Arabs. These are huge, huge numbers. And again, it's a terrible thing to say, but that's what's usually happening to people that feel that their life are in danger. They are, you know, they, 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 they look for, you know, to scapegoat others. They look for others to blame in the threat that they experience. They look at all people among the out groups as one. For them, everyone, all Arabs, all Palestinians, they're 
like a, a homogeneous you know, entity because you cannot take the risk of trying to differentiate between different aspects within the outgroup. That's too big of a risk in the situation that most Israelis are experiencing. And what we can also see, and that's the last graph I will show you, is that it creates an increase in the legitimization of violence towards Palestinians and towards Arabs within the Israeli society. I'll summarize this, this, you know, this part by saying that, and I'll, I'll drop this for a second. There is one thing that Jewish Israelis are asking from the from, from, from Arabs within Israel when summarizing everything that I said up until now. Jewish Israelis are asking Arabs within, within Israel. They, they, they basically tell them, that's a critical time. You need to make a decision. Are you with us or are you against us? We understand that in routine days when you know Hamas is not trying to annihilate Israel, that's okay. You can say, I identify with Palestinians and I'm Israeli. I'm part of the Israeli society, but I also have relatives outside of Israel. But in these critical times, what most Israelis are telling Arabs in Israel, you have to make a choice. You're either with us or you're the enemy. And that's a very, very, very challenging point for the dynamic of Jewish-Arab relations within Israel. The last thing I want to, I want to talk about is the Arab perspective. And that's even more complicated. I'll, I'll try to do it in three or four minutes and then take some, some questions. I don't think that I'll add anything new by, by telling you that you know, this really crazy situation adds another layer of complexity to the anyway very, very complicated situation of Arabs, of Arab citizens in Israel, or Palestinian citizens in Israel. For them, they consider themselves in many, many ways, and, 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 and for good reason, you know, the victims of this attack of Hamas on October 7th. Many of them were hurt. Some of them were kidnapped. And many of them helped Jewish Israelis to deal with the situation. And at the same time, they pay a huge price since October 7th within you know, the, the, the life of, of as citizens within the Israeli society. And, and that's very, very, very difficult. While saying that, I will say many of them feel like, you know, they don't have anyone to turn to, you know. I mean, who would help them if Jewish Israelis would attack them right now in Israel when, you know, the, 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 the Minister of Internal Security is, is Ben Gvir, who is, who is a, you know, racist and, and, and I, can, I can say many, many things. I mean, many of them feel like they're, they're I mean, they don't have anyone to turn to. They don't have anyone to protect them within this situation. On the one hand, they're the victim of the Hamas attack, and at the same time, they're victim of the aggression and, 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 and difficulties that many Jewish Israelis are experiencing within this situation, and they don't have anyone to turn them to. It's not surprising that you know Arabs now are saying, I don't know if probably some of you have seen it, uh, more than 20% of Arab students these days are saying they're not going to go back to the universities because they're afraid of going back to the universities. These are things that are happening today. At the Technion in Israel these days, there are you know Jewish students who are saying, we won't go back to campus if Arabs are coming back as well. It's a very, very difficult situation for many, many Arabs. At the same time, at the same time, Many of them, and we see it mostly among the, the, the younger generations, many of them are experiencing some challenges, challenges in terms of the way, you know, in terms of their identity, the way they perceive themselves. Think about the situation. Think about a young Palestinian citizen of Israel who for many years see herself or himself as 
you know, citizen of Israel on the one hand, and at the same time support the Palestinian cause and want to end the occupation, and suddenly see people, you know, the Hamas, that are doing these terrible things in their name, in the name of someone who's trying to end the occupation. Of course, that they don't think that they're do, they, they did this, or many of them, most of them, don't think that they did it, these things in their name, but it creates a challenge. Can I still identify with these causes of ending occupation when people are doing these kind of terrible things in, in my name? It creates huge, huge challenges for many Arabs within, within Israel. And the last thing I want to mention, and that's again something we need to talk about and we need to put it on the table. The fact that it's not considered a legitimate act within the Israeli society these days to even empathize with the suffering of people in Gaza, to even empathize with the fact that, you know, 5,000 children, innocent children, were killed in Gaza, the fact that it's not considered even legitimate to express empathy creates a huge psychological challenge for many Arabs in Israel. Think about people who have family members over there, okay? And people who has to suppress their very, very authentic emotions on a daily basis. This is a huge psychological challenge that again, creates potential for escalation, uh, for, for an immediate escalation on, on a daily basis. The one thing, you know, remember what I said about what the Jews are asking for Arabs, they're asking for them to choose you either with me or against me. What Arabs are asking from, from Jews these days, and I hear, I hear it from many, many, many of my Arab friends and, and colleagues, they're saying, we want to know even in this, you know, huge challenge that Israel is, is, is going through, we want to know that our citizenship, our affiliation within the Israeli society is not conditional. It's not, we want to know that we're part of the Israeli society and it's not conditional and it's not dependent on whether we say this thing or another thing. We don't want to feel like, you know, if we say the wrong thing, you can exclude us from, from Israel tomorrow morning. And that's a very, very meaningful challenge for Arabs, but also for the dynamic and nature of Jewish-Arab relations within Israel these days. I want to stop and maybe take one or two questions. I don't know if, we, okay, <laughs> or, 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 or we should stop. The <laughs> I, I think we could take one or two questions. The chat has been a bit of a conversation rather than direct questions. I think the, the main question that we saw that Ron answered is how, uh, knowing that you've done only one survey, how might you, without suggesting what people are feeling without a survey, how might you expect that as the war goes on, attitudes may be changing um, since the 18th? So, We've done, I, I mean, we're doing, I mean, we've done more than one survey. Um, I will say that there is something really, really encouraging in the fact that people feel that the worst nightmare is not really happening. And the fact that people had predictions, very negative predictions about what's going to happen. And these predictions actually did not came through, you know, did not become the, the reality. Then, then I think that it, it has the potential of, you know, maybe even improving the dynamic of, of relations between Jews and Arabs within Israel. The second thing that should be said is that levels of anxiety are also going down a little bit. So we're not in the same situation as we has been on October 7th or even on October 14th. That's a very different situation. I think that, you know, people talked about, you know, a, 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 a war on the north of Israel from Syria and Iran and Hezbollah and Hamas and, 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 and we're not sure where Israel would be. And then Arabs would join. The, 
and it's not happening. Terrible things are happening here, but this is not happening. So I think that in, in this regards, we can be at least a little bit more optimistic than, we, we, than where we, we were uh, right after the events of October 7th. There is one thing that I think that creates a, a challenge, and that's the fact that Jews and Arabs in Israel are exposed to a very, very different reality. Most Jews in Israel don't see anything about what's happening in Gaza. And most Arabs in Israel watch, you know, Al Jazeera or other uh, 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 TV channels that are not from within Israel, and they are exposed to what's happening in Gaza on a daily basis, which means that there are people who are meeting, you know, in, in the office in the morning or in class in the university, but, and, and they know that there's tension and there's conflict, but they see very, very different realities, not just subjectively, but of, objectively they are exposed to very different things. You know, when we say that almost, you know, that, that you know, such huge number of, of Palestinian children are, 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 have been have been killed in, in in Gaza, and most Jews, they don't know the numbers. They don't see the they don't see the pictures. They don't they, they they don't most of them don't care and are not even motivated to 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 see it or to experience any empathy. This can potentially create more tensions, and 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 this is where I see the the the, the challenge or one of the challenges. If. Uh, if there are no other questions about this, I think that's a, actually a very good segue to, so knowing that this is the reality and that the war is not over and continuing to be the way, what can people, uh, what what can people do during this kind of uh, uh, circumstances? We, we can think about immediate, right? Like the immediate concern was, another May 2021 or worse. Um, it looks like you said like that that's so that could happen, but it has not happened. Um, now it's about these, how do we sustain under such circumstances today in the short term and then um, hopefully sooner than later in the day after. So, so, so I, I want to talk, you know, I, I, I want to leave enough time for one to speak as well. So I'll just like, take three or four minutes to talk. I think that the, first of all, we have to think about today. And the main challenge today is in, in we think that the main challenge today is in the sh shared spaces or in areas in which Jews and Arabs actually interact with it, each other. And this is where, you know, maybe there's a potential to develop more constructive relations thinking about the day after, but, but mainly to prevent escalation today. And I'll, I'll just mention four or five points, you know, or, or things that we think that can be beneficial when we think about communication between Jews and Arabs, and both in terms of the leadership and in terms of lay people. And, and, and I'll just mention them and maybe we can talk about them later. The first thing is, I mean, we have to acknowledge the psychological situation of people within this, this challenge. So, don't, let's not talk in these nice words of, you know, shared destiny and shared society and we're all in this together. That's not relevant to the real psychological mindset of people right now in Israel. So my first recommendation would be to distinguish what's happening right now from what happened before. So things say, saying things like, you know, we have many disagreements. We have many conflicts. We disagree on many things, but now we have to deal with this challenge together because we want to think about the future of living together here, you know, Jews and Arabs within the Israeli society. That's the first thing. The second thing, you know, many people ask me, you know, how do we deal with these levels of fear? With the fact that people are really afraid of sitting in the same office together or interacting and I, and, and, I, and I would say, you can't deal with this. I mean, that's totally legit. Let's normalize it. Let's tell people, you know, that's perfectly fine 
that you're afraid of each other these days. If, if it wouldn't have been the situation, you wouldn't have, have been a normal person. Let's legitimize the fears. Let's legitimize the anxieties that people experience. And let's use more, I would say, more instrumental arguments, more instrumental arguments that would try to promote more normal life. For example, you know, if I'm thinking about shared spaces within the workplace, I would tell people use arguments like, let's don't lose what we've already achieved here. You know, we've already created such amazing relations between Jews and Arabs within, and it's totally, you know, legit that we feel fear and it's totally legit that we're angry at each other these days, but let's not lose what we've already achieved. A third thing is as much as we can correct the misperceptions that I've mentioned before, this would be very, very beneficial for the relations. If Jews truly believe that most Arabs in Israel want to hurt them and to join the Hamas tomorrow morning, but that's really not the reality, we should do whatever we can to correct these misperceptions using data, using examples, using you know, speeches and statements from leaders. And this can be done very, very easily. And, and maybe, maybe the last thing that, that I wanna talk about is to talk about shaping new norms. One very, very positive thing that happened is that many leaders, both within the Arab society and within the Jewish society in Israel, went out publicly immediately after the events of October 7th and said, you know, the things that happened there are totally immoral. No one can accept it. Arab leaders have said it since day one. And the fact, and this should, you know, get or or, or, or this be, I mean, we need to make sure that all Arabs and all Jews in Israel are hearing these things and also Jewish leaders. You know, Gantz has been saying every week since October 7th, Arab, Arab citizens are in Israel are not the enemy. We have no right to exclude them. We have no right to discriminate against them. They're part of this, of the Israeli society. Creating norms or shaping norms within this situation are ve is a very, very important move. And I'll say just one, one last thing. If we feel that what we see here is a success story, and it's, I know that it's a little bit strange to talk about a success story given the situation and everything that we've been through since, since October 7th, but at least within the context of Jewish-Arab relations within Israel, if we feel that what's shaping here is a success story, we need to start telling the story publicly and as much as you know, as 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 much as we can to as many people as we can to talk about you know collaborations between Jews and Arabs, to talk about mutual help, to talk about mutual empathy, to talk about the fact that everyone predicted that we're going to see violence, but there's no violence on the streets between Jews and Arabs, and you know talking about this success narrative is part of shaping a new norms for the relations between Jews and Arabs. So this might be a very good moment for me to pitch the call that we're doing tomorrow about uh, grief and resilience, the, the shared impact of October 7th in the South. Maybe Miranda will be able to put the registration page on that. Um, given the time, I know there are more questions, especially about how not only the war in Gaza, but uh, events in the West Bank are affecting the larger picture and a, a small conversation about uh, leadership statements that feeds into what you're saying. But I wanna take it to um, Ron to, to both share a little bit more of the implementation side of these insights, uh, what you think could be done and maybe respond to some of these questions. Hopefully we'll have time for more Q&A at the end. Thank you so much, Ron. Thanks, Leron, and thanks to Task Force for inviting both of us, and Iran and me. I really see many friends and supporters of Accord, and really thanks for joining us. Uh, so I, I want to describe you shortly what, what we see as the re reality of the ground, which is, of course, a result of what Iran described as the, of the attitudes of, of Jews and Arabs, and, and what, what we see as, a, as, as the goals 
that we put on ourselves in accord, and we also think that those are the goals of the Jewish Arab field in these very days. And to share with you shortly what Accord does and what we think are the challenges that are in front of us. I'll try to do everything in 10, 12 minutes. So the, 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 the reality on the ground, which is derived from two factors, A, what Iran described, and second, also something that Iran describes, those factors in the Israeli society that works to bring us to escalation, that unfortunately those factors exist and work even systematically in their efforts. So I, I want to mention five points of the reality, which I think that it's important to note. A, there is um, a relatively large number of, of in, in different places of demand to distance Arabs from Jewish spaces or from shared spaces, uh, uh, demand to distance Arab teachers from Jewish schools, to distance Arab employees from uh, from places in which they meet customers, etc., etc. Unfortunately, those demands come also from center and even left circles in Israel, and, and this is new phenomena we didn't know new we didn't know in the past. Um, the second thing I want to mention is that Arabs by by themselves are uh, avoiding, or not all of them, of course, but but not small number of Arabs are deciding to avoid coming into a Jewish cities or or, or shared spaces. The third point is a severe intolerance in the Jewish public to exp political expression of Arabs. And Iran gave uh, uh, Iran gave examples of that even statement about you know being emp empathetic to the death of kids in in in, uh, of, in Gaza is considered by unfortunately by many in the Jewish public as someone that they are totally intolerant to. Uh, there is also a very severe intolerance to the Palestinian identity of the Arab citizen, uh, which is something which is not new, but it is in the level that we have never known before. Uh, the result of all this is a lot of tension in the shared spaces, uh, a lot of tension, a lot of conflicts in the shared spaces, uh, especially in the employment places and in the academia. And, and, the, and, and the fifth point is there is a real danger of escalation into violence. This is the reality that we see on the ground. Uh, of course, facing this reality, there is a, there, there are a lot of efforts to avoid this uh, detour, detour, uh, escalation into violence. Uh, and um, you sure know that many NGOs are working on this. I think that NGOs and also from your side of philanthropy can be proud about the infrastructure that was built in the recent maybe even decade that now is working really hard days and nights to avoid this process that might lead us into violence. And, and this is, of course, good news. And, and so far, the effort succeeded. Um, facing, all, facing this reality, we, we see three main goals currently in the Jewish Arab field. The first is like the trivial, to continue all the efforts to, and to avoid the situation getting into a violence between Jews and Arabs, and we should remember that the violence that we saw in May 21 is not the maximum possible violence. There is so much weapons now in the both side, and, and, and a much negative scenario is unfortunately possible. The second goal is keeping the functioning of the shared spaces, and some of the shared spaces face a big difficulties of functioning. Uh, and not only we want them to be functioning, we want them only to be functioning in a fair way to an Arab citizens. Or if I'll be more honest with, with you, I, I don't think that it is, uh, um, I, I think that we should, the goal is that they will be less unfair towards Arab citizens. Uh, and, and this, I think, is an important practical goal. And the third goal is something that Iran mentioned very much, is to to shape perception and attitudes and narrative of Jewish and Arabs inside Israel about the relation between Jews and Arabs and about the potential to continue to share the citizenship. As, and, and as everyone mentioned, this, this perception is being determined in these very days. And, and, and that's, that's a very important goal. And related to this goal, I want to mention that this goal is very much re relevant not only to the shared spaces, in which so many of us in NGOs and philanthropy are dedicated, but it's also very much and even more important in the homogeneous spaces, in the separate Jewish and Arab society, in the separate Jewish and Arab media, in the separate Jewish and Arab education systems. In those places, in these very days, the perception and what people think about the narrative about Jewish-Arab relations is Israel is being determined. Um, 
facing those challenges and those goals, I'll share with you uh, shortly what we do. Uh, in Accord, we have a few uh, areas in which we arc. One, one field is supporting public campaigns. There are now a uh, few public campaigns in Israel whose goal is to uh, avoid this escalation into, uh, into violence. Uh, we always say that intuition, intuition uh, sometimes misleads when you want to choose what messages are effective. In the current time, intuition even more can mislead, and we work uh, 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 with with some campaigns. Some of them are already in the air. Some will go public next week and in the next weeks. That will, uh, and some of them are, and that's good news. Our big campaigns will be in the media, in Israel, and in the billboards, and all of them are are, are directed in the same goal to avoid uh, this process that might lead us to violence. Uh, and a second, and even uh, a main field of activity uh, of us in these days, and of course, as Accord is not the only players, there are, thanks God, there are other players that are working with us in those fields, uh, is working in, in, the, in, in the shared spaces, especially in the employment market, in the academia, and in the mixed cities, in order to provide managers and leaders tools to address the challenges that they face. We should all remember those people are not experts in Jewish-Arab relations. They are not like all of us in this call. They open the factory, they lead some engineering you know, uh, uh, faculty in the Technion, uh, or, or they lead like a call center in Carmel. They are not experts in Jews and Arabs, but they face maybe the hardest ever challenges in Jewish-Arab relations. Okay? Their employees are not ready to sit in the same room with the other colleagues. Their employees are not ready to continue to work with their colleague because in his Facebook uh, profile, there is a Palestinian flag. So the HR manager should decide what to do. But nothing in her, you know, in her, in her training didn't prepare her to address these challenges. Uh, and, and what Accord does in this day is providing all those leader and decision maker and manager to think. One is it insights to understand what's going on between Jews and Arabs in those spaces. Okay, and, and those are things that are uh, in, in the framework of what Iran described you. And second is a very, very concrete recommendation. What messages we suggest them to send their employees? Do, do we suggest them to encourage political uh, discussion in work? Or do, we, or do we suggest them to not to encourage this political discussion? What do we suggest them to do when there is a complaint about what's going on in the social media of the employers, etc., etc.? Um, and, and, and we found that providing these two things, the, insight, the insights and the very concrete recommendation, is a big help to the people in the field. We provide it by guidebooks and by workshop and by consultation. I, I can tell you that we have never seen such an high demand to our, to our services. And, and I be, I'll be honest, it's not only because of us, it's because the field is really burning. People are facing a very, very severe challenges. Uh, and, and the feedback that we get is that our, uh, um, that support that we give is a very, very helpful to the people in the field because they, they've been left like with, with no support for this kind of challenges. And, and we also see that we, we succeed to influence. Many companies, many organizations are adapting this, uh, our, uh, I'm sorry, many companies and organizations are adapting our recommendation and, 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 and we see it function as an alleviate factor. Um, I, I, I want to say that uh, the academic space is preparing itself to the opening of the academic year in a few weeks from now. And, and really almost every day is a thread from the, from the minute that Jews and Arabs will meet in the classroom. Think about it. Jewish students, some of them will, were in a reserve duty. Some of them lost families. Some of them lost their friends in the, in the battles in, in, in Gaza. Arab students will come back to the, uh, to the, to the universities after they are so they have such they are so angry about the killing of Palestinian kids in Gaza by, by thousands as, as as we all know and they are going to meet in the same class and and the university asks themselves what should we do with weapon do we allow weapon do we don't allow weapon what what would we do with the, with the flag Israeli flags Arab students that will choose to have Palestinian flag in their in their zoom and things like that and and there is a lot of uh, uh, there, there is a preparation in the academic uh, space, and we are there to support them. Um, 
I, I don't have time, so I'll just say in one line that um, we also invest a great deal of effort in the education system, in the homogeneous Jewish and Arab uh, uh, education systems, uh, with the goal of addressing the challenges. I mean, you saw the numbers in the graphs that Iran showed. Those, those such high levels of fear and aid towards the other groups are a very bad factors and message for the Israeli society and, and the education system on both the Jewish and Arab side must address this challenge in, in a preparation for a better future between Jewish and Arab. I'll end by saying a few sentences about what, what I think that all of us should uh, uh, kind of take on ourselves to prepare for possible scenarios. Actually, today we set for a full day all the management team uh, of Accord, and we thought about, you know, what can be a possible scenarios uh, in different axes of the war, of the Jewish-Arab Jewish relation, and also the political polarization, which is not the subject of this call, but, you know, it, it, there is a very high probability that we are going to a period of time of a severe political polarization when the war ends. And, and, and I think that, that at least two scenarios should be taken into account, uh, at least, and that is what we do. One is a scenario that when the war ends, it's, there is still a scenario of getting into violence between Jews and Arabs. It, it, might, it might look weird, but there is a real scenario that kind, you know, after we, after we took, care, took care of the enemy, of the external enemy, some factors in the Israeli society might want to take care of the uh, internal enemy. And it can, it can be even more complicated if it will come with a, a, an, um, an ignition or eruption of the political polarization during a, a, around the protest that will probably uh, be in Israel in an effort to change government and, and all the things that everyone is expecting that will happen when the war ends. Uh, and it just means that uh, as much as all of us are happy that so far, okay, we succeeded to prevent getting into violence, we should remember that, that we, we have still a lot of work to do and this challenge is facing us even when the war ends. The second scenario is more optimistic, and, and that's why I choose to open with this scenario, is that, you know, the, the war will end, there will not be escalation into violence between Jews and Arabs, and in that time, I think, it will be very important to continue to work in the shared spaces, so that the shared spaces will function as a spaces in which the process of repairing the relation between Jews and Arabs will begin. And according to our research, there is a real potential that the places and, and the factors from, from which the process of healing the, the Israeli society in the Jewish Arab context will happen, in the Jewish Arab context, it might be, or there is a real potential that the shared spaces will be those places, and, 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 and we think that, uh, and, and we plan to put a lot of effort in working with the shared spaces when, when, when the escalation kind of ends in, in the kind of the post-escalation time. Thanks.